Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. I like Renee's response. She said, thanks for having us. Like, what would we do? Like, kick you out or something? You're like, no, no, Paul. We don't want you today. Sorry. Go outside. But today, the sun's shining. It's a wonderful day. It'll be above freezing. But thank you for being here and joining us today. We do welcome you in here at St. Olive Junior Church. One quick announcement, there is a Christian Education Committee meeting on Tuesday night, I want to say at 7 o'clock. And uh, hey, I did the evening with my eyes closed. So that's good because I'm on that committee. So, um, um, so that's happening. And other than that, we don't have any other announcements. We can get ready to worshiping together, singing together, just uh, joining in fellowship. Let's stand and we'll start with a word of prayer as we start in here. This morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace, your mercy, which is new every morning. Thank you, Lord, for that. I am grateful for Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our hope. And I thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. May we be faithful to you in return. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here today. And may it be a blessing for them. And may we in turn bless your holy name, Lord, with our song, with our uh, with our preaching, with our teaching, and just giving you all thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for being here. Right? Amen. We welcome you in today. Thank you for any opportunity to praise God together. We hope that today will be a special moment for each and every one of you. Praise God.
Lord, when, when, when we recognize that you are our God, what lies in store for us, Lord, it doesn't mean everything will be perfect in this world because we live in a sinful world. But Lord, if our God is for us, if you are for us, what can stand against us? Nothing and no one, Lord, when we are acting in accordance with your will. Help us to do that today. Open our eyes so we can see you clearly. And help us to act according to your will. Fully in love and truth. We give you all thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Not always an easy thing to do. But when we wait upon the Lord, His strength will come upon us as well. Here we go.
with this. That I have freedom that I never knew before because you live for us. Help me to experience that every day fully and recognize that that is mine, that is for every individual that knows you as Lord and Savior forever, for eternity, that you did it for the world, you did it for me, and you didn't do it as a way of, or as a temporary fix. I'm thankful for that, Lord. Help me to recognize that, that I don't need to live this life like it is a temporary fix, then I need to keep going back for salvation. It was done once, forever. Help me to live, Lord, with that freedom and with that surety, but also with Christ focusing my every thought, my every word, my every action. And what I do glorifies you. Lord, I thank we have opportunity to worship you today in song. We have a worship opportunity in giving our tithe and our offering that we can say, thank you, Lord. Because you're alive, I live. Because you're alive, I can give. I can give in the tithe and offering. I can give in my time. I can give my love to you, to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to my family. Lord, help us to see how we can live fully when we accept Christ fully. Lord, we give you all praise and all honor. In Jesus' precious name.
Christ to die on the cross in order to purchase our salvation, to pay for our guilt, to become responsible for our sin. Father, we are so, so grateful. Lord, we want to share that love with others in how we live, in what we say, because we want others to glorify you. We want others to become part of the kingdom of God. Father, forgive us when we forget that we are now children of God. Forgive us when we become caught up in the things of this world and we don't remember what is eternally important. Lord, we pray that your spirit would cause us to focus upon those things, to focus upon Jesus, to keep our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Keep us from being distracted by this world. Keep us from thinking about ourselves, but rather how we can serve you and how we can love you. Father, we ask that you would help us right now to put everything at the feet of the cross, the foot of the cross, so that we can focus upon your word, so we can hear your Holy Spirit teach each one of us what you want us to learn as individuals. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Children, come on up for children. Earth was to die 
in order to give us life. That was his purpose. The cross was where his focus was going to be. Now Satan and many others would like us to believe that the cross was the end of it all. That was it. No, nothing else was going to happen after that. He accomplished what he wanted to. They want to convince us that the cross was a major glitch or an oops moment. God didn't see that one coming. But you and I know from the Bible that this was God's plan before this world came into being. It was part of God's plan already. Now you and I know that there are a lot of benefits that you and I receive personally because of the death of Jesus Christ. Even that song, you know, in the scripture reference that we had earlier, it's a once for all sacrifice. We're not moving for some reason, I'm not sure. There we go. So there are some things that we're going to understand. First of all, as a result of the cross of Christ, Christ dying on the cross, you and I are assured of our salvation, are we not? This is all introductory, by the way, so don't look for blanks. It's a big blank space there. Okay? We're assured of our salvation. Without the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the church doesn't exist. Without the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there is no purpose for us gathering here on a regular basis. We proclaim Christ and Him crucified, right? We don't just proclaim a good teacher, a good man. We proclaim Christ and Him crucified, for without the crucifixion there's no salvation. So that leads us to the next area. As a result of Christ's death on the cross, we are declared by God to be justified. It's a legal term that Paul uses. Basically that means we have been declared righteous by God. When Satan says, look at you, look how evil you are, you don't deserve to be in heaven, Jesus has justified us. We've been declared justified. We have been given Christ's robes of righteousness. The sin is no longer there. It's been removed. That's a benefit for us. Also, as a result of Christ's death on the cross, we are redeemed. We have been purchased from the slave market because we were all slaves to sin. From that slave market of sin and we have been purchased to be bond slaves of Jesus Christ. We are adopted children. We have been bought. As a result of Christ's death on the cross, we've also been made acceptable to God. The scripture calls us that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. That's that neat theological word that we're going, what is that? Very simply, that means that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was enough. It satisfied God's wrath against sin. There's nothing that you and I have to do to earn our way to heaven. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's awesome. And as a result of Christ's death on the cross, we are reconciled. We've been brought back together. We're no longer enemies with this giant chasm of sin separating us. We've been brought back together because of the cross of Jesus Christ. <laughs> what Jesus did on the cross. Now you and I may not have thought we were enemies, but we were. Bible tells us that we were, at one time, enemies of God. Leon Morris actually came up with a list uh, of things that benefit us as a result of what Christ did on the cross, okay? So, for the next three weeks, no. <laughs> you can see this list, right? And if anybody's interested in it, in it email me and I'll send you a copy on, in the email. But we have been redeemed. We've been made nigh to God. You know what that old British word nigh means? We've been brought near to God. We're no longer far away from Him. We're reconciled to God. We as Gentiles have been made one with the Jews. We are cleansed. We are justified. We're sanctified. We're set apart. 
We are perfected forever. We have been purchased for God. The bond that was against us, in other words, the debt we were supposed to pay, has been paid for by Jesus Christ. It was nailed to the cross. We have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. We can talk to God directly. You don't need to call me up and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I will pray for you, but guess what? You can pray too. Isn't that cool? We can go directly to God because of what Jesus did on the cross. We are loosed from our sins. Sin has no power over us anymore. We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We, by His cross, peace with God has been secured. His blood established a new covenant, and His death redeemed us from all iniquity. And you see the scripture verses there beside there, or the addresses rather, not the whole verse itself. You know, there's countless hymns, gospel songs, contemporary uh, Christian songs that write about what the death of Christ means for humanity and especially for the Christian. But one of the things I've noticed is there's not a lot written about the significance of Jesus' death for himself. What was significant about the cross of Christ? What was significant about his death on the cross to him? Now, if you and I had been with the disciples, we may have been just like them. Hearing that Jesus is going to be leaving, hearing talk about a death, we, we may have looked at this as, wow, what about me? What, about, what are we going to do? We, we look at all the ramifications for us and our perspective, but very few of us would have considered what benefit this is for Jesus. And I believe that's part of what John is talking about here in this section. So what I want us to grasp here, and this is not anything profound, but I think it helps us to get a bit of perspective. If we understand the cross from Jesus' perspective, it can help us to understand what is eternally significant. Okay? We even talked a little bit about this during Sunday school this morning, about the fact that our lives may not be long on this planet because of persecution. Don't whine about it, don't complain about it, don't gripe about it. Rejoice. Rejoice. And if we see things from an eternal perspective, we won't be thinking about, well, oh, that's not fair. That's not right. I have rights. I'm a U.S. citizen. No, you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This is a secondary citizenship. So we're going to look, first of all, at verse 28, where we see that the cross allows for the king to come. The cross allows for the king to come. And so, yes, all the other blanks will have the letter A and a cut sound at the end, okay? Or at the beginning of the next word. I think I left two blanks for it, didn't I? I, I did that for it, I forgot. Okay. So the cross allows for the king to come. He says, you heard that I said to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, Jesus was looking at the cross from his perspective, and that seems to be why he makes this comment, you heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. Now, as you look at the Gospels, in particular the Gospel of John, it seems like there's about a dozen different times that Jesus uses the idea of I'm going away and I'm coming back. I'm going away and I'm coming back. <coughs> In this next part of the verse, he talks about this genuine love. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Why does he say that? Well, probably because the disciples were thinking about themselves, right? Well, they had three years of being with this wonderful Savior, the Son of God. They've seen him do the miraculous. He's taught them with authority from God's Word. You've got to leave. They gave up everything for him. He's going to leave. And so that's why Jesus says, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced. You see, they weren't yet seeing things through his eyes, were they? Anybody here struggle with seeing things through God's eyes? I think most of us do, right? We, we're kind of egocentric. 
the world revolves around me. Just in case you didn't know. Okay? And that's how we, we, we do these things. But if they would have been seeing the cross from his perspective, they would have rejoiced. And there's so many reasons that they would rejoice, and we're going to be getting into that as we go along the way. But you and I have to look at the cross and what it entails from the broader perspective. It's not just about us. Oh yes, Jesus did die for you individually. Absolutely he did. But if you look at the cross purely for the benefits of what it did for you and me, it causes our focus to be very, very narrow. It limits our understanding of who God is and what his broader purpose is. That's why there's so many Christians that struggle when bad times happen to them. Because they're not seeing the cross from the eternal perspective of Jesus Christ. They're seeing it from, this is what the cross is supposed to have done for me. Jesus goes on to explain what one of the areas is. He says, because I go to the Father. You see, if Jesus would not have gone to the cross, he could not go back to the Father. Because it was the Father's will, the Father's plan, that he would go to the cross to lay down his life for the sins of the world. His whole ministry time on this earth would be a success if he goes to the cross. You know, he set aside his heavenly rights. He intentionally limited himself while on this earth. He would be separated for that short moment in eternity while on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, but it was still temporary. That's a good reason to rejoice. Well, how do we know it's temporary? Because it's, I go to the Father. Because I go to the Father. That means he's not going to stay dead forever. He will go to the Father. Once again, Jesus is going to be with the Father and then sitting down at the right hand of the Father. He was going to be exalted and lifted up at the Father's right hand. And every person who had ever dared or will dare to mock or persecute Jesus or the bride of Jesus Christ will one day bow the knee to the judge of their lives. But also... For all of us who have said yes to Jesus, we will one day bow and worship the Savior in our souls. The one who loves us more than anybody ever will. The last phrase, he says, for the Father is greater than I, has been so <laughs> mistaught over the years. It's not reducing Jesus to second class status. That's not at all what he's teaching He's talking about the hierarchy. He's talking about roles and functions. That he willingly submitted himself to the hierarchy of the Father's will. But as far as their nature, their person, they're equal. They're one. We even see this taught in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. He says, Christ Jesus, although he existed... In the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Go ahead and move to the next slide, please. This isn't doing it. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Secondly, we see that the cross will affirm, or it does affirm, that the king is correct. The cross affirms the king is correct. It says, now I have told you before it happens, prepositions are good, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you. It seems like a good reminder to the disciples and to us that Jesus is God. Most of us remember last Sunday. Half of you were here. The other half of you didn't turn your alarms on because we canceled church. The weatherman said we're going to have 24 inches of snow. 
two inches, maybe. Two inches we have. Weathermen, even with the most incredible, sophisticated technology, miss a lot of forecasts. Miss a lot of forecasts. Las Vegas, Super Bowl time, NBA playoffs, boxing matches. There are people who get paid a fortune who are bookies, <coughs> odds makers. I don't know this from personal experience, I've heard about it. I'm too Dutch to do those things. They don't get it right. They miss it many, many times. Remember the New York Jets, 1967 I believe it was. Those amazing Jets, Joe Namath. First guy I ever knew that did panty nose commercials. <laughs> Strange bird. Blew everyone out of the water when the Jets won the Super Bowl. Who'd have thunk it? Now, Jesus is not probably right. He's not 99% right. He's 100% right all the time. How can that be? He's God. He's God. And he says to the disciples, I told you this now so that when it happens, you may believe. Then you know I'm not caught off guard. The Father's not caught off guard. All part of the plan. Now there's many religious charlatans today as there were in the times of the Bible false prophets misleading the people, and sadly, many people accept them rather than deal with them as they should. And after all, their messages are positive. They're uplifting. They seem to be accepting of all. They're very charismatic. They, they have a way with words. And no, it doesn't all fit in with what the Bible says, but maybe we've misinterpreted the Bible all these years. After all, the Bible is a living word. And I've received a word from the Lord. Folks, that's absolute heresy from the pit of hell itself. It will never contradict God's word. We have all that we need in the Bible right now. And the Holy Spirit is not in the business of creating new things for us to hear. He says, I will not speak much more with you. Jesus isn't concerned about this. That's not what he's saying. He's, again, reminding them the time is near. This is the last of the stuff I'm going to be sharing with you guys. I'm telling you this now so that when it happens, you'll know. We see also that the cross attests that the king is clean. The cross attests that the king is clean. I've shared with you when I've gone out with the Billy Graham Association as a crisis counselor with the rapid response team, we go out with Samaritan's Purse. And Samaritan's Purse Ministries, they have volunteers. Any one of you can go serve with Samaritan's Purse for a volunteer in a crisis situation, clean up, whatever. Now, some of you that have skills with building and stuff like that, they use you in a heartbeat. You serve for a week at a time. At the end of every day, we come in, we have our supper together in a church facility, and afterwards, the head of the Samaritan's Purse organization that is there that week will debrief us. And in the debriefing process, basically asking what things we saw God do, uh, any concerns, any frustrations, etc. And then because you've got maybe 50 to 60 people uh, with six to eight of us chaplains there that are working in a crisis situation with people, tension can sometimes develop, right? You know, even among, among strong Christians. So one of the things that he would say after every debriefing, before he would dismiss us, he would say, are all hearts clean and clear? Are all hearts clean? In other words, do you have something on your heart that you need to get off your chest? Do you have some anger or bitterness towards someone that you need to resolve right now because you're going to go out there tomorrow and work right beside them? 
Is there something in your own life you need to deal with? Because now's the time to do it. Because what we're doing may be physical, but it's a spiritual war. Are all hearts clean? He says, for the ruler of the world is coming and has nothing in me. There are three times that John is seen as quoting Jesus as describing Satan as the ruler of the world. And Satan is the ruler of this world's systems and thought processes. Anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God is of Satan. Now Satan wasn't given the role of ruler. He stole it. Albeit God gave him permission. He stole that responsibility and that title when Adam sinned and rebelled against God. He is the ruler of the world is coming. Well, here Jesus states that the ruler of the world is coming. It's present tense. It's not futuristic. It's very near. So what's he referring to? Well, we can assume he's referring to Judas and all the religious leaders that were coming and acting on behalf of Satan. Right? That makes sense. Because Satan has spent since creation, when he rebelled against God, trying to usurp God. And this isn't the first time that we've seen Satan being in direct conflict with Jesus while Christ was here on this earth. You remember as a small child, two years or younger, Satan prompted Herod to put out this decree that all Jewish male children, two years under, would be killed. I got a nap. Nope. Because God appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get down to Egypt. <laughs> then some 30 years later, the Spirit of God led Jesus out into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by Satan. Now just in our humans, we're going, what? You know, I would not tell my child, go out there so you'd be tempted by Satan. My child's not God either. Jesus is God. And God the Father knew this had to happen to show that Jesus would not sway from the line which God had called him to do. Three different times that we know of, Satan tried to get Jesus to do it another way. Try this option. Try this option. And Jesus always countered with the word of God. He would not be manipulated. Throughout Jesus' ministry, Satan tried to get Jesus destroyed many times. When Jesus would speak things that <clears throat> would set the religious leaders off, says, and so they attempted to kill him. But they could not because it was not yet his time. Throughout Jesus' ministry, Satan has been after Jesus to kill him. Ah, the cross. Let's do that. Even with what is ahead, Satan will think that he has won. But what Satan didn't realize that even the crucifixion of the Son of God on the cross was part of God's plan. It had been prophesied Way back, Genesis 3.15. The crucifixion will still show that Jesus is in control because he is obedient to his Father's will. You know, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Satan thought that the cross, he triumphed. Jesus triumphed. Satan lost. Because Jesus became victor over sin and death and the grave. And ultimately, one day, we'll cast Satan down and bind him. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. That through death, his death, Christ's death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. In fact, the last part of this particular verse here, Jesus says, He has nothing in me. 
shows that Satan had no legal grounds against Jesus. You see, the only reason death could occur is because of sin. And this is actually, actually a Hebrew idiom. Not an idiot, a Hebrew idiom. <coughs> showing that the devil has no legal grounds against Jesus. The Greek actually shares it by using a double negative, which makes it an absolute. D.A. Carson writes, he says, how could he, in other words, how could Satan have anything in Jesus? Jesus is not of this world. Jesus has never sinned. The devil could have a hold on Jesus only if there were a justifiable charge against Jesus. And then Jesus' death would be his due and the devil's triumph. Carson put that very well, I think. Thus Satan could not and cannot have any claim against Christ. No foothold whatsoever. And I like what Warren Wiersbe says about this. He says, since we, you and I, since we are in Christ, get this, Satan can have no foothold in the believer's life unless we permit it. Isn't that exciting? It doesn't matter what Satan tries to do to you. He has no authority, no power. He can have no foothold in your life unless you give it to him. That's encouraging. All because of what Jesus did on the cross. We see finally that the cross announces the king's commitment. The cross announces the king's commitment. <laughs> He says, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let's go from here. You see, the victory was indeed Christ's. It wasn't Satan's. The cross was what Jesus had to endure to have victory. You remember earlier Jesus spoke of how a person knows what love is, the greatest mark of love, it's not just that we love one another, but it's that of obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Here, he shows his love and commitment for the Father by being obedient to the Father's will. The last sentence where it says that they're leaving, let's get up and go from here, it, it, it suggests that they're leaving the upper room. They're going to go on their way to Gethsemane. And to get to Gethsemane, they're going to have to walk all the way through Jerusalem and go up that little hillside there to Gethsemane. Now there's more teaching that Jesus is doing, but you've heard of peripatetic teaching, haven't you? We've talked about it before. Peripatetic teaching is when you walk alongside. That was very much the way they taught in those days. It wasn't nice little classrooms with the desks and the lined up chairs. They would walk out together. They might be sitting down on the ground, or they'd just be walking, and they would be teaching. That's what, remember the Sermon on the Mount, on the way there? Jesus is talking about, see, the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. What do you think they were doing? They were walking. They were on the way. Jesus took part of his creation and used it to teach the disciples. But on the way to Gethsemane, my belief is, he probably was doing the same thing. It wasn't a foreign thing to him. He's going to continue to teach them. So what exactly did Jesus' death mean to him? I believe Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, offers one of the most glorious descriptions in the Bible. He says, for the joy, go ahead to the next slide, please. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus showed his love for us, and especially for the Father, by willingly going to the cross to be crucified according to the Father's will. And of course, you and I know that he showed his love towards us by willingly and voluntarily laying down his life for us. Now, Satan thought he had the victory, but he was quite clueless, wasn't he? How many of you have read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Most of you have read that. C.S. Lewis very appropriately worded this type of thing. When the white witch's servants, when they killed the Lion King, 
as them. And he made the comment, he says, they may have understood part of the mystery that they could kill the king. But they never understood the deeper, we're too far here, never understood the deeper mystery that the Lion King would, in fact, conquer through his death. Why did Jesus come? To die so that you and I might live. If Jesus would not have gone to the cross, he would have disavowed himself as the Son of God. He would not have had a successful ministry. He would not have accomplished what the Father wanted for him. You see, understanding the cross from Jesus' perspective can help us to understand what is eternally significant. It's more than what the cross has done for you and me. That's important, yes. But it's a reminder that without the cross, Jesus could not be king. Without the cross, he could not be a king who would come back because he could never have gone back to the Father. We can also better understand that the cross is a reminder to us that Jesus is absolute truth and he's correct all the time. We never have to worry about that. We are also reminded that Jesus was able to go to the cross and give his life for us because there was absolutely nothing in his life which would give Satan any charge against him because there was no sin whatsoever in King Jesus. No sin at all. The cross also shows us that before time began and will continue for eternity, the great love that the Son and the Father have for us. You never have to worry about the Father and the Son ever being in conflict. They're one. You never have to worry about the Son wanting his own way. He wants the Father's way. He wants the Father's will. These are all affirmations of our King Jesus. You know what it's like to feel vindicated when you've been falsely accused of stuff, attacked, and then the information comes out and people go, oh, you were right. How much more so for Jesus? Because remember, not only was he fully God, he's also fully man. So for him, the cross showed that what he did for the Father was exactly what the Father wanted. And he knew it, but I have a tendency to think there's something about the humanity <coughs> that experienced satisfaction. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, suffering and shame, who came to this planet, Philippians 2 tells us, willingly setting aside, casting aside his rights, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to, but gave it all up. He's experienced everything that we experienced yet was without sin. That's awesome. Yeah, it benefits us, absolutely. But when you see the cross in view of Jesus' perspective hopefully will help you to see everything that happens all around you from an eternal perspective. It's not so much about what's in it for me. It's more about how can I bring glory to God. Whatever the situation may be. And sometimes it's difficult. But with God's Spirit empowering us, we are able Guess what? We are hyper-conquerors. We're more than conquerors through Him who loved us. If that be the case, then it's not about me. It's got to be all about Jesus. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Father, it doesn't always make sense from our earthly human logic how a death how a false arrest, how a false crucifixion can lead to a conquering king. But we understand from your word as your spirit has illumined our hearts and minds 
that this was part of the plan before time began. That it was essential that the sinless Son of God would willingly lay down his life for the sin of the world. Father, we are thankful that your Holy Spirit did convict us regarding our sin, that you did draw us to your Son, Jesus, and that you have forgiven us, and you've given us new lives. We look forward to that day when we will worship and praise you forever and ever. And in the meantime, we still can worship and praise you forever and ever, even while walking this planet. Father, help us to see through your eyes. Help us to hear through your ears. Help us to have a heart <coughs> that sees a lost and dying world that needs Jesus. And give us boldness to proclaim Jesus Christ. Crucified and now risen, Lord and Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh.